first question, what do you aspire to? What's your ambition in life? What do you want to accomplish? You know, when we're younger, those type of questions, you know, we think about when we're in school, well, I'd like to grow up to be this, I'd like to grow up to be that. For Christians, the Holy Spirit instructs us to focus our ambitions in a certain direction. And that direction we're going to find today is very different than what the world says is important. Those directions are that direction and our instructions are found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> and we're going to be reading verses 11 and 12. So the Holy Spirit is going to direct us in the way we should go. These are our ambitions. These are our aspirations. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 says, and of course this is being written to Christians, that you, Christians, also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. He gives us what our goals in life should be as Christians. Not to amass a great wealth or to have a wonderful, huge home or uh, places of honor. Here's what he says, Christians, you need to aspire to. This is your aim. This is what you need to accomplish. Number one, aspire to live quietly. If you look up the, uh, the Greek word that's used there, it's the idea of not running hither or thither, but staying at home, minding your own business. Minding your own business. This means not causing division, not causing strife, not causing a dis disruption. Uh, we go over a few pages to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul kind of addresses this again in a different way. 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11 and following. He says, For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Work in quietness, eat their own bread bread. So, aspiring to lead a quiet life means as best you can lead a peaceful life. In other words, free from hostility, free from conflict toward others. You're not trying to cause problems. Yeah, now problems may come up, but you're not going out trying to find them. You're not trying to, quote, stir the pot. <clears throat> you know, this... Uh, definition of quietness is used of a Christian woman. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, this is how Peter describes a Christian woman. Verse 4 of 1 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> In talking about the Christian woman, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. Gentle and quiet spirit. So when he says, aspire to live a quiet life, he is saying, try to get along with people as best you can. As best you can. Also it means, try not to go out of your way to draw attention to yourself. You know, look at me. Remember, this is something that Jesus really condemned some of the scribes and Pharisees for in the first part of Matthew chapter 23. He says, you, you, you wear the phylacteries, you wear uh, and you go uh, in the prominent places to pray so people will see you. That's drawing attention to yourselves. <coughs> Paul, when he wrote to the church at Thessal Thessalonica, he said, you try and lead a quiet life. Don't go around trying to draw attention to yourself. Not saying, oh, look at me, look at what I've done. You know, not desiring people to look at us and, and all that we're doing. We don't want to make a display of ourselves. That's a quiet line. We don't want to make a display of ourselves 
to the extent where uh, we're, we're trying to show the world, look how wonderful I am. Look at how great I am. Look at all that I've done. We don't draw attention to ourselves. That's a quiet life. That's an ambition. Also, it means not allowing the world to distract us. We do have a mission. You and I have a mission. We don't want the world to distract us from our Christian service. We have important things to do. Things to do for Christ. Things to do for other people. In other words, you know, taking the gospel to people. Serving others. Ministering to them. We have important work to do. We don't want to let things of the world distract us. That's a quiet life. You know, the parable of the sower and the seed refers to this. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. This is the explanation by Jesus of that parable. Jesus says in verse 14 of Luke 8, Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. See, they're choked with cares of the world. We can't let the cares of the world keep us from accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish. If we really want to be servants of Christ, we want to watch out for these obstacles. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, a few more pages over, you come to verse 4, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Of course, the point is, we're a soldier now in Christ's army. He's the one that put us into this army. He enlisted us. We don't want the things of the world to distract us from carrying out our duty. All of that is involved in aspiring to live quietly. That's an aspiration. That's a goal. That's an, that's an ambition that should be on our part. Well, it goes on in our text for Thessalonians chapter 3, or chapter 4, and he says, After you aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands. First of all, mind your own business. This would include not meddling in the affairs of others. You know, we read a while ago there about being a busybody. Always wanting to know what other people are doing. You know, especially when it's not important to you and it's none of your business what they are doing. That's evidence of a disorderly life. Remember we went read that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. That's evidence of a life that is not in order. If you're a busybody, if you're always trying to find out other people's business, you're not leading an orderly life. Not at all. In other words, it's an undisciplined life. If you control yourself, if you discipline yourself, you're not going to be wasting your time in being a busybody. Always trying to find out what everybody's doing all the time. We're not to be nosy. We're not wanting to know everything going on in other people's lives. You know, many people just love to hear the latest gossip. You know, what's happening with Mr. X or what's going on with Mrs. Y. In <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 26, the wise man leaves us with wisdom. Proverbs 26, verse 17. Proverbs 26, verse 17. He who passes by and meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a dog by the ears. What's going to happen when you take a dog by the ears? Probably going to try and bite you. That's the point Solomon's making here. If you meddle in something that's none of your business, it's probably going to come and 
bite you. All right? Don't invade people's privacy. Don't interfere in other people's lives. Let them open up to you. Now, if they come to you, that's entirely different. You know, let them open up to you if they want to. You know, if someone is not ready to share, if someone is not ready to, to talk about things going in their lives, don't pressure them into doing it. Let them do it on their own time. Be there for them. Be there for them. Don't dig. Don't pry. All right? He says, mind your own business. And then he says, work with your own hands. Now, God expects those people who can, and not all people can for various reasons, but God expects those who are able to work to do so. If we go to 2 Thessalonians 3 again, notice what he says there in verse 10. And we read verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> verse 10 says, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. And he goes on and tells them later in verse 12 to eat their own bread. Alright? So these people he's talking about here are not willing to work. They don't want to work. They can work. They just don't want to. They're idle. Don't want to do anything. You know, we hear the old uh, saying, an idle mind is the devil's playground. And there's a lot of truth to that. You know, being idle, doing nothing, gets a lot of people in trouble. And it happens. <coughs> we should have stayed in Proverbs. Proverbs 19, a few chapters over from where we were. <coughs> the wise man tells us, verse 15 of Proverbs 19 says, Laziness casts one into a deep sleep. And an idle person will suffer hunger. <coughs> and again, we're talking about people who are lazy. They just don't want to work. Not that they can't work. They just don't want to work. Now as Christians, we're supposed to set the example. Christians are meant to to work. Just like Paul wrote there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. <clears throat> if you're not willing to work, you shouldn't be eating. So Christians are meant to work. We have responsibilities while we're on earth. The wise man, once again, this time in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, makes this point. Verse 18 of Ecclesiastes 10. says this. 10, 18. Because of laziness, the building decays, and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. There he's talking about, of course, someone's home, and if they don't care, take care of it, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's, it's going to eventually fall down. You don't take care of it. Through laziness. So again, God's people are men to work. We have responsibilities while we're on earth to work. And we can't ignore them. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he told Timothy this in his first letter, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. <clears throat> he says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith, and it's worse than an unbeliever. What's the world going to think, Paul says, if the world sees a Christian who's able to work, who's able to take care of his family, refuses to do so? Think about the, the mark on the church that's going to leave. Those people won't want anything to do with the Lord's church if they see a Christian acting like that. So we have these responsibilities to take care. Doing nothing is bad in God's eyes. We're to be diligent in our work. Back a few pages to Colossians chapter 3. Paul told the church there 
these words, whatever you do, this is verse 23, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Whatever you do, whatever kind of work you're involved in, do it heartily. In other words, do it with all your heart, all your might. Whatever level that is, do it. If you can. So there's an accomplishment, there's a goal, there's an ambition, there's an aspiration. Work with your own hands. Well, then he goes on and says in verse 12 of our text, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Where to walk, live, behave properly toward outsiders. Of course, he's talking to people, non-Christians, those people outside the body of Christ. Set a proper Christian example. Peter talked about this more than once. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he says this in verse 12. 1 Peter 2 and verse 12. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit tells us, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, Again, unbelievers, non-Christians, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. By your good works, all right, which they observe. <clears throat> Set a proper Christian example. He says that should be every Christian's goal and aspiration. Hopefully, our walk might lead others to become followers of Christ. That's one of the important parts. They see that we live honestly, that we're trustworthy, that we're people of integrity, that we work and we work hard. Something they might want. We're to be light bearers to the world. Back when Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, he told them this in Philippians 2, verse 15. <clears throat> Philippians 2, verse 15. Again, we're to be light bearers to the world. He says in verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless, that's our behavior, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you, sh you shine as lights in the world. See, we are light bearers. You know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you're, you're the light of the world, you're the salt of the earth. <clears throat> our light, you know, like uh, uh, Peter or Paul wrote there, <clears throat> the world is dark. Wicked, perverse world. It's a dark world. So Christians are to do what? Our light needs to penetrate. Alright? Light up the world. Show the world what living for Christ actually means. There is so much darkness in the world. The world needs to see Christian behavior walking properly. You know, sinful behavior, when it's seen in Christians, may cause people in the world to speak against the gospel, to speak against the church. I know this has happened many times in my lifetime where people speak against the church or speak against Christ because of how a Christian was living. Maybe they were uh, deceitful in business or they were caught stealing or whatever. Again, that, that makes a, a very dark spot on the church. So our proper walk is so important. That needs to be an, an aspiration, a goal. Every morning when we get up, I want to walk properly. And also he says, at the very end of our text in verse 12, that you may lack nothing. You know, our proper walk includes not being in need. This goes back to not being lazy, not being idle. We don't want to have others have to support us you know if we can support ourselves we should never take advantage you know of the kindness or generosity of others yes we can accept it but we don't want to take advantage of it 
we need to do our best to care for ourselves. One final time in Ecclesiastes, toward the end of that very wise book, the wise man tells us this, chapter 11, verse 6. <clears throat> He says, In the morning sow your seed, and in the evening do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Work. Do your best. Help. You know, you don't know, especially when you help other people. Like the wise man says, you don't know which will prosper. Either this or that. Maybe both of them. So he says, <clears throat> you don't know the outcome. But do good and maybe some of it will produce good in other people's lives. So we need to do our best to care for ourselves. And then to help others. Those are our aspirations. That's our goals, our ambitions. Aspire to live quietly, mind your own business, work with your own hands, and walk properly toward outsiders. Maybe we should have that put on a, <clears throat> on a, a board or something in our home where we see it every day. This is what my ambitions are for the day. This is what my goals are. This is what I want to accomplish. Those things that Paul told the Christians in Thessalonica. Those are great goals, great ambitions that all of us need to strive for. So this morning we have an invitation song, and that song is meant to cause us to think about our relationship uh, with God and whether that relationship needs Him. And if so, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing this song. <clears throat>